Um, hi, my name is Linda Shea. Uh, I co-founded a crypto hedge fund called Scalar Capital. Um, and before that, I was at Coinbase for a little over three years, uh, first doing blockchain investigations, working with regulators and law enforcement, and then later was product manager for internal tools. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Ayton. I've been in crypto since 2013, and I've got a number of businesses. So I own a next generation ICO platform. We've got a crypto exchange. We've got a TV channel, and we've just shot the first episode of a crypto game show around pitching ITOs, um, which is a lot of fun. And uh, I'm a rampant libertarian that likes to make money. I don't know how that makes you feel. <laughs> My name's Jeremy Gardner. I founded several organizations in this space. I also helped launch the first utility token ICO with Augur and the first security token ICO with Blockchain Capital. I now run a hybrid venture hedge fund called Awesome Ventures, and we are hiring. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've been writing about Bitcoin and blockchain space since 2012, and uh, in that time there have been multiple waves of interest. There's uh, 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 anytime anything big happens, like Silk Road, there's new people who want to know about it, um, and. This is, to me, like the next wave. It's the ICO wave. And um, in past waves, I've had people coming up to me wanting to understand how the technology works. Um, in this wave, uh, I just have friends calling me saying, what token should I buy? Um, and that's all they want to know. They don't want to know what they are, what they do. They just want to know what's the next big one. Um, and I guess my first question is, what more is it than that? What, what is there to this uh, innovation, the ICO wave, um, that's changing the way that we fund companies? Uh, and what's the ideal for, for how that change is going to look? What are they good for? Paradi uh, ICOs have the potential to be paradigm-shifting financial instruments. They democratize access to at the early stage of ideas in a way that never before has been possible. Uh, they allow global access to those ideas and the global fundraising for ideas. It, it's no longer limited to Silicon Valley's boys club. And I think that's very important. Uh, at the same time, however, what you have is a lot of ignorance in the market. And, and, and that can be incredibly dangerous because if people don't know what they're buying, then there can be a lot of lashback as a result. Yeah, and I would agree with that. Um, one thing that I think uh, token sales really allow um, uh, projects to do is essentially bootstrap a community. So if done right, uh, you can really bring in a lot of amazing uh, interest into this space. So um, I was advising Xerox during their token sale, and I think Xerox has one of the most vibrant communities, and it's really attracted a lot of developers to build on top of it, because now these, um, these people own part of the project, in a way, part of the protocol, and so they're incentivized to see this succeed. And so there, people are writing like educational materials, and they're creating websites to track the activity in the space. So it can really create a community around it too. But if if it's not done right, you can also bring in a lot of speculators and ignorant folks into the space, and that's actually not the community you want. So um, making sure that you actually need to do a token sale is really important. And then if you do a token sale, doing it right and attracting the right people to be involved is the most important part. Nick, should we remind ourselves why ICOs exist? The criminal central banks have destroyed the value of the money that we all hold, the assets that we have, they print too much money, and the value of the US dollar in your pockets has gone down 95% in the last 80, 90 years. Banks are not lending money. The VCs are Ponzi schemes, okay? They bet one in 20, you know, and they use money just to gamble on the next opportunity. So. ICOs are about a liberating way of entrepreneurs raising capital. They don't have to sell their souls to Satan. They don't have to dilute. They can design a token that delivers, let's say, certain things to themselves without having to give away 90% of their company and be stitched up with mezzanine debt. So that's why ICOs are becoming popular, and that's why 
they will eventually take over because it's what the people want. And I think that's a very good point, or at least some of them. Um, <laughs> but, but probably the core value propositions of ICOs is the realignment of incentives. For the first time, founders, employees, investors, and the consumers of products all want the same thing. They all want that token adoption to spread and the value to go up. And that alignment is very straightforward. There's no secondary incentives, and, and I, I think that is much better than the current financial system that we have today. Yeah, I would also argue that um, I don't think venture capitalists will go away in this scenario. I do think that venture capitalists provide value and that if, if you're a good VC, you can actually help with recruiting, you can help with advising how to actually run a, a project or an organization. It still involves making sure employees are happy and want to uh, feel like they're getting career growth. So I do think that good VCs will have to adapt to this new model, but they aren't going to go away. Okay, so, so those are some of the reasons why it might be better than older funding uh, schemes. Uh, are we really adhering to that? Is that what we're seeing happen? I mean, it's like when a baby walks for the first time, do they walk like an Olympic athlete? Probably not. It, 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 it's ugly. It, it's messy. It's, it's a learning curve. Uh, there's a lot that goes wrong at first. There's a lot of stumbling. Uh, does it mean that we're not headed in the right direction just because we're uh, tripping over a bunch? Uh, I'd say no, but there, we've got a lot of growing to do. What, are, what sure. are the trips? What? What are the trips along the way? Um, poor management of funds, raising too much money, greed, uh, securities laws violations, uh, just uh, egregious misconduct by founders. Uh, I'll, 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 I mean, you're talking about the ability to raise tremendous amounts of capital without any sort of uh, oversight or supervision or any sort of clear regulatory framework. And with that, a lot can go wrong. Okay, so let's get into regulation. Um, I was listening to a, a news story the other day, uh, but I got into it halfway through, and it was about a company that had this amazing product or was, was advertising this amazing product and, and had gotten all this funding, and, uh, and I thought they were talking about uh, ICOs. Um, because they, it ended with, with uh, the company being exposed to fraud. Um, and it turned out it was Theranos. Um, are you worried about uh, a similar thing happening in the ICO space? Are you worried about a crackdown? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, actually, I, I, I am a fan of the SEC putting in um, reasonable regulation in the space because there is actually rampant fraud and it's really hard for investors to tell what's legitimate or not, and nothing to prevent these invest these investors from just getting completely like screwed over. Um, so I'm I'm okay with reasonable regulation. Um, I think that um, I think though that there needs to be a lot of education, and the SEC has has been fairly understanding. So I I'm, I don't see that being an issue of like a crackdown. 99% um, of the tokens that I'm seeing are complete scams or uh, just used as fundraising mechanisms to just fund a project that probably shouldn't exist. So uh, that's well, if that's they what exist, I'm they should be raising equity. They shouldn't be tokenizing. Sure, them. but there's also a lot of projects where I was like, you definitely don't need to do anything with the blockchain in right. this scenario. So that's like 99% of the pitches I'm seeing. There's a lot of great ones that Couldn't I couldn't agree really more. Want. It, yeah. it, we are in a barren wasteland of garbage right now. When should when should a startup use a token? When you need a distributed, decentralized, censorship-resistant database to underlie your business and need to have a large and broad network effect in order for your system to work. Yeah, basically whenever you, uh, essentially, if you can replace that token with something more liquid like Bitcoin or Ether, that token doesn't really do anything extra. Um, and I think Augur's a great example where the system wouldn't actually function without the token. So I, that's really clear to me that that system actually needs something like that. But, but it's, it's the rare exception. I mean, I, I feel incredibly guilty creating the first utility token because almost none of these tokens actually have utility today. Isn't it interesting that the, uh, a bit like uh, the experts and children are the people that don't have any. Um, it's a bit like that with ICOs. Um, I did, uh, I've worked on about 20 ICOs and it's very different on the inside looking out than the outside looking in. 
So when you're doing an ICO, why are you there? Well, you're there because you're dealing with the banks and the VCs that won't lend you the money. Maybe your project isn't advanced enough. And the ICO mechanism gives you an opportunity to at least get your project away. Now, the bootstrap entrepreneur, you know, they're in garages up the road, allegedly. I don't believe it, but they're, they're squeezed out of the market now. You know, the bootstrapping of the IC opportunity is almost gone. And the reason for that is a combination of things. First of all, you know, the, the surplus profit on Ether and Bitcoin, where everyone was investing in every ICO, is, is starting to dry up a bit. The second thing is obviously regulation. And I deal with regulation all over the world. We have projects all over the world. And um, the SEC have provided a useful framework but they're like all regulators, they're way behind. And that's why when we designed our next generation platform, we assumed that everything is a security. At some point, the regulation will squeeze everything into existing law because they have no way of rewriting the law to cope with this. So they'll just push it into what's there. So the ICO opportunities out there is now getting quite expensive and quite tough to get ICOs away. It costs you half a million to a million dollars to do a decent job. You know, and it's getting harder and harder. Jurisdiction is a massive issue. Tax is a massive issue. Here in the US, if you do an ICO, the proceeds are regarded as you know, income, taxable income. So jurisdiction is massively difficult. So you know, we work with projects all over, and we have to engineer not only the tokenomics, but also construct the corporate entity that will, will deliver. We can talk about investor tokens and utility tokens, but I just want to put this out there. Why would anyone buy a utility token? It's worthless. So, I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I've never seen, I, I've been an angel investor and in, in venture capitalist for about three years, and I have never seen a really great idea not be able to raise a half million dollars. And if you can't raise, the bare minimum to just get your project off the ground, you definitely should not be selling your product to a bunch of consumers that are probably, probably do not have the qualifications to evaluate the technology that you're proposing building. I think that's a, a dangerous proposition because that's how people get burnt. When people get burnt, then they go to regulators and then regulators come in with the ban hammer. So I think it's actually better that there are, there's a barrier to entry for issuing an ICO rather than just it being a free-for-all where all these tokens are being issued that never actually end up getting developed. Um, can we talk about how uh, these are likely to be classified legally? Um, you've testified um, recently on that topic. Um, so what are you getting, what sort of feedback are you getting uh, there needs to be a new legislative framework. Look, the SEC, the CFTC, no regulatory agency has the right to create new laws. And th that means they can't create new categories of, of, of pre-existing laws. The only people that can do that are, is Congress or state legislatures, as we, as we saw in Wyoming. The only way we're going to see really thoughtful regulation in this space is with new laws that deal with this new paradigm. Whether those laws should be written today or in a few years is yet to be determined. But looking to the SEC and the CFTC and these other agencies, expecting them to somehow create new laws, it's just not what they do. We're going to have to go and work with Congress eventually. We, uh, we, we took a slightly different approach to that. I mean, we, we assumed that regulators are not going to do anything. Okay, as I said earlier, they're going to push you towards what's already there. So we've created a, um, let's say, a platform, a technology platform that does all the accreditation, it does all the KYC, it does all the AML, and it covers most jurisdictions and countries. So our, our approach is we assume your token is a security. Therefore, if it's a security, then you need to be regulated to finan financially promote it. You know, so all these intermediaries, these ICO advisories, these consultants, these PR marketing, if you've got a token that's security, you are not allowed to promote it unless you are a regulated entity. So 
We engineered all of this with the assumption that everything is a security. Two other things that we do that's very different. The first thing is we don't use smart contracts because they're not smart and they're not contracts. Okay? And we can accept any cryptocurrency alongside fiat currency for tokens. Now that's massive. You're a hedge fund or you're an investor, do you really think that if you're issuing your token, these people are going to buy Ether first and then buy your token? They won't. They just won't do it. You're creating friction. Uh, well, there's this concept of token abstraction, so you don't necessarily have to go through that two-step process. Something like Xerox can actually just, if you, with the click of a button, you can actually just immediately buy the token. So it wouldn't necessarily show as much friction to the end user that you would see. But that is a very important point, however, if, if, especially if you're not issuing out a token on top of Ethereum or your plan is not to, over a long period of time, expecting everyone to go buy Bitcoin or Ether, to go and use your application because your application has a specific token that has to be used. It, it's somewhat problematic, although ZeroX, I think, does help fix that problem. It's definitely the first thing I ask companies that are building technologies that do not face the blockchain using population or a crypto using population is if you're issuing out a token, how are your users actually going to go and acquire that token? If it means going to Coinbase and then going to Poloniex to buy the token and sending it to your website to use your application, never going to happen. I think even making people go to Coinbase first and buying Bitcoin or Ether to go and use your application and then sending it to the website uh, through zero access, too many steps. People need to be able to go to your website, to your application, and make payments right there, just like they do with any other payment experience. Crypto has to make things 10 times better. I think you said that on Twitter the other day. Uh, it, it does not, uh, or someone said it on Twitter the other day. Uh, crypto has to be 10 times better for people to, consumers to want to use it. And the only places we've seen that happen in the developed world so far are the same uses cases we saw five years ago. Drugs, porn, and gambling. Well, we need to get past that point. But right now, we, we do not have good use cases beyond that. It's a very sad world you live in, because I don't see any of that. You know, we support social impact programs. So in 2016, I built the electric vehicle charging infrastructure in Germany for energy. You know, that was about the mobility. So I don't see your world. So and social the, impact and is... And so people use Bitcoin for that? So social impact is, is, is a big, big thing. Wait, and so wait, do people use so Bitcoin for can I just for finish the, the topic? So... Uh, so social impact is, a, is an important thing. And, you know, to, to talk about, you know, all of the barriers around drugs and porn and stuff like that, we've already way moved on beyond that. So, so the, the things that really deliver change is the things that people can get behind. So climate change, there's massive amounts of ICOs on climate change at the moment. There's big stuff on renewable energy. There's trading platforms all over the world. You know, there's stuff to invest in, stuff to get behind in, where your token, where your investment makes a real difference. So what tokens are being used? Sorry? What tokens are actually being used by consumers in the developed world? Not invested in, used. That's not what I'm talking about. That's what I was talking about. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's move on. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the means that consumers have to actually judge these, these uh, investments. Um, one of the strategies that, that ICOs are using, or that these projects are using, is attaching themselves to big corporations. Um, and it's happened a few times in the past that uh, those companies have then rescinded uh, and said, actually, we're not. We're not part of, I um, won't name any names, but we're not part of that coin. So, um, it, which leaves people wondering, like, when we, when we see these um, projects coming out and claiming partnerships, what does that mean? What does it mean that IOTA is working with Volkswagen and Bosch? It doesn't mean anything <laughs> unless you see it on their website. If, if a Fortune 500 goes and does a press release on their website announcing a partnership with a blockchain company, that's real. Otherwise, assume it's garbage you know yeah i would i would completely agree um there's been a, a lot of like false advertising that were associated with 
uh, this company or that this uh, crypto fund or this venture fund actually funded us. And when we did background checks, the fund would actually be like, oh, we actually didn't invest in that. And even though it was like directly told um, to mm -hmm. us that they had invested. Same thing with advisors. There's been false advertisement of advisors being involved. So I'd be really, really uh, wary about when you look at a project's website and they list all these partnerships and people involved, I would be, just be really wary that uh, those are actually real um, partnerships. Yeah. Unless you see an advisor like tweet about a project or a company write about their partnership, be skeptical. <laughs> All will actually just always be skeptical in this space. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so how do you, what do you look for? What do, what's your checklist when you're assessing these? Well, corporate, I usually come in before the point of corporate partnerships. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty later stage. No corporation's really going to take a risk on a startup super early on. It usually takes a little bit. So what I'm looking for is first team, second team, third team, and then I, I start to think about the market that the, team, the, the teams are attacking. Is this something that really is greatly enhanced by blockchain technology or somehow was not a, a, a possible to approach from an entrepreneurial perspective without blockchain technology. Those are the best ones. Um, and, then, and then you think about technology, but like the tech changes. This is a rapidly evolving ecosystem. I'm not doing code reviews. Like I, I, I'm coming in so early that that's not really a component of, of what's necessary. If you know this team has a very strong background in technology and in what they're building, you don't really need to worry about the tech. I think that's kind of overblown. I've had technical advisors, I'll say, do you think this is feasible? But for the most part, it's really all about the team. It's just like traditional venture capital. We're, so we're a little bit different, but I agree, team is number one. But we also, um, we invest in a lot, of, a, a lot of the liquid coins, so that's most of our portfolio. And so we, uh, the, the projects are open source, so we're actually doing technical deep dives just to make sure that the teams are competent uh, yeah. to see if there's like best coding practices done. To be clear, I'm coming in much before yeah. coins go live. Different so stages. Different. Uh, and then another thing that I actually pay a lot of attention to, which um, a lot of projects haven't been mindful of, is the vesting schedule on the tokens. So there are some teams that will issue their tokens to their employees that just don't even have a vesting schedule at all. So the people on the team can just leave the second the token sale happens. And then same thing for investors. Like I've been offered tokens where like, oh, just no vesting schedule for you. You can you know liquidate, liquidate this whenever you want. And to me, that's actually not a good sign because you end up having all these investors that end up with like 30 to 40% discounts early on, just flip their tokens and have no incentive to be involved long term. So I, I really, really look for how they think about the vesting schedule too. I cannot wait for vesting smart contracts that really are provable. It, it, it's, it's a protocol, like it, it's something where you know that it works every single time. Because right now we're just, uh, hoping that you know these teams behave ethically, follow their vesting schedules. There are, there are some ways to ensure accountability, but it's, uh, we do not have a lot of these safety uh, guards in check yet. Um, Nick, do you think you could tell us a little bit about uh, how the exchange element of this works, um, how, how tokens uh, get onto exchanges? Um... Well, it's, it's hard. Um, so given that there's two, t the, the, the previous panel was quite interesting because uh, they were mooting the point that it's quite likely that most exchanges are listing tokens that are securities. So therefore they don't have permission to do that. Um, our view is that a large number of these exchanges are gonna be closed. But putting that to one side, if you have, issue, if you have created a token, um, and most of our clients, we create two tokens, by the way, um, and one of those tokens is, let's say, an investor token. You want to get onto an exchange. Well, good luck, because the majority of, ex uh, of exchanges will list currencies. They won't list tokens with any form of utility. And if they do list a token, then it takes many months to get on there. And there's a number of deciding factors. The first thing is, some of them are very picky about, you know, your token. You know, what's your market cap? Is it big enough? Is, um, is there big enough liquidity? The second thing is there's a real shortage of programming resource to actually engineer the token into the exchange. So actually getting, getting that going is tough. So we've, we've already got an exchange and we're currently going through the machinations of trying to find the right jurisdiction to drop it into. But because we want to launch ICOs from within an exchange, we have to have liquidity. And for liquidity, you need about a million dollars per 
per token on your exchange. So we want to go with 50 or 100 tokens, then we need a lot of capital because you're going to make a market. So the ideal situation for us looking forward is, is to mature the ICO infrastructure, is to, do, is to run ICOs within a market, within an exchange. And that's what we're aiming for. And you were at Coinbase for a while. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, Coinbase is a lot more conservative. So uh, they essentially, they, GDAX published a framework that they use to determine whether or not they're going to add something. Um, one of the pieces that I think people f forget is that Coinbase is um, actively working with regulators and, and law enforcement. So there's a lot of education involved. Anytime you list something new, you have to go to all your um, states that you have money licenses in and say, oh, this is what token we would like to add, uh, and here's what it actually is. And there's a lot of uh, confusion involved sometimes on like what this actually does. So like I remember the days where Coinbase was just a Bitcoin-only company, and when we ended up deciding that Ethereum would be added, it was a whole different conversation going from Bitcoin to Ethereum. So had to go state by state and then talk to all the different um, regulators in different countries. So there's a lot involved in just the education so that you, if you're more conservative, you have to make sure that um, some, someone's not just going to freak out and be like, hey, get, get rid of that listing. So um, I, I think there's just tons of education involved. Money transmission license. It, 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 it. The, the laws in the United States are just ass backwards. I mean, it, it, is, it costs a startup millions of dollars in several years to get a license to every state. Coinbase still doesn't have one in California. Uh, it, it, it's, it's totally nuts. There needs to be a national money uh, transmitter license that works nationwide, and that, and that will streamline things and allow for fintech innovation in such a big way. Because right now, startups are inhibited by, by the current licensing regimes. Can I make a comment about Coinbase? Sure. <laughs> Please. I'm ready for this. <laughs> so, Christmas, okay? The time when the conversation around the Christmas table is crypto, right? Everyone downloads an app, Coinbase, good app. And now all of a sudden you see Bitcoin Cash appear. No warning. No announcement. So Richard and Roger have got a thing going on, okay? Just be careful. No Ripple. Well, Ripple's not a crypto anyway. But, you know, so it's, there's a lot of funny business going on out there. And the agents of Satan are behind it, pretty much. You know, just beware. Okay. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, agents of Satan? <laughs> Do you want me to list them, the agents of Satan? Yes, please. <laughs> Central banks. We've got a really good Bank of England, haven't we? We've got an idiot running it who actually in the press called Bitcoin a currency. Well, in the UK, crypto is not a currency. So he doesn't even know his own regulation. Agents of Satan. Investment banks. What do we all think about them? We love them, don't we? They purvey failed products. Mortgage companies, failed product. Pension companies, failed product. Pensions do not deliver for people. Insurance, Ponzi scheme, requires new money coming in to support old money going out. Right. Right, so these are the agents of Satan. I hope we haven't summoned them. Um, <laughs> I... <laughs> My guess is that there are a lot of questions that are that you have specific questions. So I'm going to sort of <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to the audience now because uh, I think probably a lot of you are working on projects and might have some questions. So let's do some of that. Thank you. So um, I work here at MIT, but I'm a former investment banker, so maybe one of the agents of Satan here. But um, um, so I, I applaud. I think the 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 ICOs do really represent an open opportunity to democratize raising funds for projects. And I do believe there's a big barrier, and I see it every day, um, to access to capital. That's why the engine was created here at MIT, to fund hard tech startups. Now, one of the things I've seen a lot of the crowdfunding you know, in, in initiatives is that in, when people crowdfund the company, the rave of getting the initial funding is great, but then 
investors have a lot of challenge to following up on the investment. What's going on with the investment? Now, if you treat ICOs as securities, what is the claim that the token holders have on the assets of the business going forward? And what information are they expected to receive to assess the performance of their investments? Is that something that's being talked about? Are you thinking about that? So if you're going and saying what you're issuing is a security, you better have all the proper documentation to back that up and explain exactly how it's going to operate, how dividends are going to be paid, um, how, how, how the money is going to be accounted for, how accounting is going to take place. I mean, you're, at, you're adding, I think, a much higher standard than has previously existed for tokens in the past. You can engineer a token with all of these rights, if you like. So. He's absolutely right. You know, prospectus rules do apply for, for a security. So all your statements in your white paper, um, they, net, they better be checked and validated by a third party. You know, so you don't want the class action like Tezos, for example, where they overpromised in the white paper and delivered nothing. You know, that was a scam day one. You know, so you've got to have the right checks and balances. And then what was said earlier is, what is the governance around the drip feed of the money? You know, a couple of young guys raised 50, 100 million. You know, how are they going to be held accountable for delivering on the milestones in their white paper and their project plan? You know, and, you know, we've been thinking about post-ICO governance services around custody, around escrow, about drip feeding the fees, uh, you know, the money to these guys. So it's important, but step in right. So you can design them as a convertible loan note they can have step-in rights. So the engineering of the token can be anything you like. It can look like a conventional product. Uh, hi. Can you put three things together? Uh, Professor Catalini yesterday said that for a startup that's involved in a network effect, you need to have a token. I'm paraphrasing. The uh, people, uh, the session before, basically said you want to have an, a securities token first and then a utility token later. As, as sort of the, the default. And then just earlier we said we heard half a million to a million dollars to do that initial securities token. So if you're a startup in this context, how do you sequence the investment or how, how do you go out to the financial map markets or to the hedge funds or the investors in that, this example? I think look, you, there's, there's a number of strategies. Um, so, you know, we're, we're seeing t ICOs running alongside conventional fundraising. So if you haven't got rich friends and you're not going to your family like you would do no normally to get some initial capital to get going, then you can do a private sale. So you can wrap it up to get some, some, some capital and bring in early investors. Now, we work with a lot of funders who, who will come in early as a, like a loan, uh, but they want to get out when the crowd arrives. So it's getting that initial investment to, that, to start the journey, because it's hard. You can't do it on nothing. And then you can do a pre-sale, and then the pre-sale legitimately, providing you declare what you're doing, you can use some of the proceeds in the pre-sale for your public sale. But you don't have to do any of that. I mean, we're now seeing a trend where a lot of the, you know, the ICO funding is, is, is done without an ICO and then they actually just launched the token. So there's lots of different strategies, but you need some capital. It doesn't matter where it comes from. You formulate your team, formulate your thesis, and then go find qualified early investors. Uh, reach out to funds such as mine that specialize in this, that have experience doing ICOs, and give us your pitch. I'll invest in a team without a white paper as long as they have a good team and a really good idea for what they're going to build. I'll come in super early and give them the capital that they need to go and actually build out this idea. Uh, that's what VCs are here to do. We don't need a white paper. We don't need a bunch of marketing hype. We're here to provide the ground level infrastructure for smart people with smart ideas. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, utility tokens and token economic models. So a lot of people I've talked to about this concept would say, you know, it doesn't really make sense to buy a Big Mac with McDonald's stock. But in my opinion, I think that different token ec economic models could work. So from your perspective, how do you uh, examine the way the token economic model works 
and how do we determine whether or not it's actually going to work and be sustainable in the long run? Is it just something that we have to try and brute force through all the different options with millions of ICOs? Or is there some way that you have a framework to determine whether or not it's going to actually be viable long term? I mean, generally, the answer is just it's not going to work. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, that's a very unfortunate answer. But the fact is, is if you're making someone buy a crypto token to use your platform business software, you're adding too much friction just at the, at the outset. What you have to be providing through your service is something that is so much exponentially better than what previously exists in the world today that people are willing to go that extra step to go and buy your crypto token as opposed to using a competitor that's slightly less good but allows them to use a credit card. So that's like, that's the framework. It's like, is it really way better? Because if it is, then, then you may actually have something quite revolutionary on your hands. But this is why 99% of utility tokens are garbage. Because for the most part, you do not need a token. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, generally you don't need a token, but um, you could also consider, so let's say you do need a token, you want to bootstrap the community. Um, airdrops have been a fairly popular method. So instead of trying to attract investors into the space, you can actually attract people that would actually use this. So that's another method of distribution. Hi, yes. Uh, earlier you said that Coinbase had been working with uh, law enforcement. Can you comment on the full extent of that? <laughs> I mean, Coin Coinbase is a regulated uh, fintech company, and, and they respond to subpoenas. So that's pretty much, that's that's part of any fintech company. That's regulated. Can you comment on the extent of the subpoenas? I mean, you know I couldn't do that. Um, I, I definitely couldn't. <laughs> oh, sorry. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. It's important to note that almost everyone in the industry, at least the companies that are still around today, um, have made an active effort to engage in dialogue with regulators. And that's something that if we want this regulation to move forward in a healthy manner, we have to do. So it, the, the, the folks that kind of admonish teams for working with regulators, I mean, the, the, they're missing the point here. The regulators are going to come in either way. Whether they have a good education on what they're regulating, it's up to us. The only caveat to that would be that you have responsible regulation and communities like the US and like Western Europe, but then you go to certain jurisdictions, none of that matters. It's, it's the Wild West. I want to um, turn our attention back to the previous comment that VCs are here to stay in the space, in the ICO space. And you know, if, we take, uh, if we take Nick's realistic assumption that you know, we should just consider everything as a security. That means we can only sell tokens to institutional investors. And then, you know, taking the implications of that forward, if you're selling these tokens and they are continuously being collected in the hand of institutional investors, how does that impede our ability to actually create a, uh, a utility token atmosphere, right? Because the whole philosophy of utility token is that any common man can benefit. But if they're being collected in the hands of VCs, do you find that problematic? I mean, yeah, I, I definitely do. Um, I. I Although I, I do think that there are methods where you can get the community involved still. Um, like I mentioned, there are airdrops. Although if it's a security token, you're going to have to have some holding period where you can't distribute it. Um, but yeah, I certainly think that's a barrier. And that's why I actually haven't been going down the route where I think that every single token should be a security token. I think there are definitely tokens that don't have to be security tokens and don't have to be concentrated in crypto funds and, and VCs. So I completely agree with you there. I, I think it's a horrible precedent to suggest that all crypto tokens, all ICOs are securities. I think one, it's idiotic, um, and two, it, it is really repressive to innovation. So yes, I, I, I'm with you there. You can't have both. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It can't be security, but also this like totally democratic fundraising mechanism. Either there are ways to issue out these tokens to individuals that are not accredited investors, or it's just really not that revolutionary, and it's not why I got into this. Uh, we have 30 seconds if you want to go. <laughs> okay, I'll try in 30 seconds. Uh, I'm a former city councilor here in Cambridge, so kind of on the regulator side of a lot of things. We saw Uber when it came out, et cetera. Um, it's really hard for us looking at the libertarian f fringe or maybe even majority in crypto to understand how that's going to square 
with the social justice democratization aspect. And, and so hearing that pensions are scams, hearing that insurance is a Ponzi scheme, hearing these things and then being on the inside and looking at it, I've seen the mismanagement and it's mismanagement. It doesn't mean the paradigm is wrong. It certainly doesn't mean the paradigm is a scam. How are we going to now square this libertarian versus democracy or versus social justice aspect or tension in crypto now? And how are we to understand your dogmatic comments earlier, which I don't think square with reality? <laughs> I'll give you an example. I wrote an article in Forbes uh, last year about draining the Hollywood swamp. And uh, I guess we all knew that it was a systemic scam in Hollywood. It's fake accounting, it's sexual inequality, it's pay inequality, it's oppressive. We all knew that. But everyone shut up and said nothing. Okay, then everyone broke ranks. So we're working on a great ICO at the moment, and we're going to LA tomorrow, and that cuts out Hollywood. So this is where the, the restructuring of industry, so it puts the fan in control, where the A-list, the content provider, the artist, the musician, the actor wants to deal with the fan direct. They do not want to be scammed by Netflix, by Amazon, the layers in the middle that distort the reality. So this is a direct model, and it's called bingeable. So have a look at bingeable. You know, it's very cool, but it restructures the entire industry, okay, and collapses it down. I, I, just, I just add that the libertarian ethos of Bitcoin and the early kind of innovators in this space is actually very complementary to social impact in that we live in a growingly Orwellian world and blockchain technology has a capacity to be an antidote to that to give sovereignty to the individual online in a world where there is growingly less. And I think that's important no matter what political side of the aisle you fall on. And look, I'm launching a social impact fund and that's, we're thinking about investing in technologies that make the world better. But I think there can be a strain of libertarianism and all that because it's about giving rights back to the individual in a world where we have less and less. All right, thanks a lot, we have to wrap, okay. Thank you, everyone.